Welcome to Tangential Soup, a weekly podcast discussing life in Australia, technology, food, fitness, and the like, hosted by myself, David Caddy, Melbourneian independent developer and tea enthusiast, as well as my good childhood friend, Alexander Carr, Sydney cider, slave to the man, karate practitioner, and lover of adventure. This week, we talk about karate achievements, novel beehives, and Elon Musk on artificial intelligence. So, Alex, the thing that everyone I'm sure will be dying to know. Yes. Is how uh, did avid you do listeners. in your karate grading? Are you now a brown belt? I am now a brown belt. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It is it is actually a very big accomplishment for for me personally. And it's kind of made me realize though what a what a task it'll be to get to black belt. So is there nothing I... in between that? Like the next one is the black belt? No. So the next one will be senior brown belt and then okay. it'll be black belt. Um, but basically when you get to senior brown belt, you start to become... Really, this is just the lead up to black belt. So when you're working through the lower belts, you're just kind of learning what you're doing. At least this is how I see it. You're just learning what you're doing and um, just just learning how to kind of hold yourself and building up your strength and everything like that. Um, whereas I think that once you get past brown belt, it becomes a lot more about developing mental toughness as well. So learning to actually push yourself through fairly physically strenuous exercises and um, and making sure that you're actually training regularly and staying and staying fit. So I think that this, in my mind, would be seen as the lead up to, uh, to Black Belt. And if I take my foot off the gas now and kind of stop training, then it's going to be a long road to kind of get back to where I am. Mm, mm. So I can't, I can't, I don't really feel like I can stop in any real way. So how'd you go with this one? Did you just power through or just scrape by by the skin of your teeth? Uh, I felt like I was really fit. Um, I felt like the fitness wasn't actually a problem. So I did all the fitness exercises that required of me, which was the 100 sit-ups, 50 push-ups, uh, 70 squats. And um, we also have to do repetitive kicks as well, which I think I've mentioned. Yes, yeah. Um, so 300 of those kicks and that was fine um well i mean it wasn't fine but i got through it uh i think technique wise i probably could have been a bit better um i think that was that was what let me down okay but uh when i say let me down i think that was my weakest point i should say it's yes you know i still obviously passed so it didn't let me down entirely it's sort of just like a binary yes you did it or no you didn't or is there some sort of scoring system uh so it's a pass or fail um but basically the fail or the, the criteria to pass is that you do most things correctly. Okay. So you can like do not so good at one particular part and then still get through. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you could just do, so you could do really badly at one part and do well at the rest and still get through, or you could do, you know, maybe not so well at one or two or three parts and still, still scrape through. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think there were a couple of comments about some of my kicks not being on point so well, um, which means that my technique wasn't looking very good. And apparently I have a habit of, even though I think I can get my kicks quite high, uh, I just tend to swing my leg up as opposed to actually, and what that means is just kind of letting my leg swing up as opposed to actually making it go up quickly and then pulling it down quickly. I just you mean kind of swing it up. And... Being a bit more deliberate about it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. But overall, just smashed through it. I think I think I did actually. I felt I felt quite good about my fitness as well. How'd you go I, in the fighting parts? Uh, the fight the fighting's actually always fine with me. I think because I'm probably a bit bigger than most of the people okay. that I'm training with. Yeah. Um, apart from one guy who is quite a bit bigger than me, and every time every time he kicks me, I just go flying backwards, <laughs> like in the movies. Yeah, and that's just basically my experience of kind of fighting him but other other than that i didn't have too much difficulty mm. uh and yeah o- overall I'm, I'm really pleased but i think I, I can't as i said i can't stop training and i can't stop pushing myself so i uh, i want to get to the point where i'm ready for my senior round belt in about a year and then hopefully 
again ready for my black belt about a year after that so two years it's my timeline well that's excellent so we can check in in another 12 months and you'll be another half the way there um hopefully hopefully david anything else happening up there in sydney you didn't get along to uh ozpod i did not no i didn't um we actually had our uh our local elections on that day ah i see right which i didn't realize until very recently (laughs) um any strong candidates that you'd heard of before you went to vote no um in fact the the only person who i well no i knew i knew a couple of the candidates because um they obviously they put their signs around the around the train stations ah yep and um there was there was one particular lady called what's her name anna anna somebody uh and i know her because she has signs absolutely everywhere not just around the train station but everywhere uh and she's also been handing out flyers as well and i got a i got a flyer in my mailbox with a handwritten note on it saying sorry i missed you from (laughs) anna and i think she was a local labor candidate oh wow she really uh pounding the pavement then yes she is (laughs) Obviously keen to win. Quite young, though. I think most of the people in uh, in our area, at least who uh, who were kind of putting signs up, were were quite young. So there were a couple of independents that put signs up, um, and both the Labor and Liberal, liberal candidates were uh, were quite young as well. Hmm. Yeah, the only the only one who I think was a bit older was the Greens candidate. It's interesting. It's not the normal spread of things. No, it's not. Do you want to hear something funny as well? So. Um, my area is the inner west, uh, which is which is where I vote in Sydney, and um, it's kind of you know well well it's not a poor area of Sydney. It's not any of the richer for us. The North Shore is is kind of the richer area of Sydney, and the eastern suburbs are as well. And um, we had about I think seven or eight candidates um, who we could vote for. Apparently, uh, the eastern suburbs had three, and. There wasn't even a Labour candidate there. Wow, that's <laughs> so that well, obviously because they're such it's such an ingrown oh sorry such, such a, a strongly seat. yeah yeah liberal area that the Labour don't even bother. <laughs> it's kind of a defeatist attitude, though, right? <laughs> like you might not win this year, but you got to get some presence into the market to for people to start thinking about you. And if you're well, never it's... there, then it's never going to happen. It just seems so strange, doesn't it? I mean, mm. why would they? But I guess, <laughs> well, I suppose they know what they're doing as far as these things go. Do you know what the results are yet? Uh, I actually tried to look them up because it was quite interesting to see whether that, uh, I don't remember what her name was, Anna Person 1, um, but I'm not sure. Okay. It's a bit confusing as to how to find out. So I found the uh, there's a vote, there's an information website uh, that the government put up on voting. And it had dates, and I think there was a date that the results were finalised, and they were a couple of days ago, but I couldn't actually see what the results were. So <laughs> maybe it just didn't display correctly on my phone. I don't know. The government websites, they're never good. Yeah, they're not, are they? The information's probably there, but damned if you can find it. Yeah. It's because, you know, everything goes to contract, to tender. So Does it? Yeah. Oh. So whoever puts in the lowest price... And we'll tick all the boxes that are laid out in the brief. Just win it. <laughs> but ticking well, the boxes is far from doing the best job. So that's why that happens. Oh, uh, right. Well, there you go. <laughs> Speaking of ridiculous government things, have you uh, have you received your postal vote for the marriage equality? Not as per yet. Oh, good. Have you? Well, it's just that mum has received hers and Samantha's received hers as well, but I haven't received mine yet either, so... They probably do it in waves, I guess. Yeah. It costs so much money. Yes. I mean, it's kind of a good thing in a way, but I kind of wish they would just go ahead and pass the thing without any input from the public. The the, the vote isn't legally binding in any way, though. It just shows No, the... I know. It's so stupid because if the majority vote yes, then it will go to the Senate or whatever (laughs) yes i believe so and then people still have to pass it yeah and if the majority is no then just nothing will happen so there's like two points where no could be 
in effect and two places where yes has to go through you know what i mean it's sort of yeah it's not a fair system it's it's a ridiculous system and it costs 200 million dollars <laughs> <laughs> and you know there's already been enough polls and things around the nation to know that what the result is going to be in all likelihood unless people just don't fill out the thing. But if everyone does, we know what it's going to be. Yes. Well, we we hopefully know what it's going to be at least. I think overall, though, I mean, nobody thought that Trump was going to win. but No, I know. But like at this point, it seems like the majority want yes, and then most of the rest of the other people are just so <laughs> sick to death of it that they're just like, yeah, do it anyway. Um, yeah, which is maybe not the best reason for getting it through, but still, you know, it affects <laughs> change, so not a bad thing, really. Do you know how many people are actually eligible to take part in it? Um, it's everyone that's of voting age now. So there was a big push on to um, have people register in the electoral roll if they weren't already, like if they just turned eighteen or whatever. Okay. Because yeah, if you not if your name is not on the electoral roll, you will never get the set, sent the vote, so you can't vote. But um, right, okay. If you're over eighteen, you are eligible. Excellent. Hmm. Well, so I don't well. know if it's too late now. <laughs> probably will be by the time I release it. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> if there's any young people out there, probably put your name down on the list. Well, I mean, I personally believe that uh, everyone should be voting in the federal elections as well. So. You should be registered in all cases to vote. This video, Alex, of the new beehive was yes. genius, wasn't it? It's it's actually amazing. Um, it's a very simple principle, but uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. My brother sent me this, and I was sort of going along at the start. They're talking about, oh, you know, how annoying it is to harvest honey out of beehives. And I'm like, yeah, okay, so you've got some solution for this. I was just waiting for the moment where they were going to say how they were sort of doing it because they have like basically taps coming off of a beehive and just honey flowing out of it. I'm like, okay, this kind of almost seems <laughs> like, a, well, like a hoax almost. Yeah. And then they get to the point where they show the mechanism, which is essentially the honeycomb layers in the beehive are man-made hexagons. And then when you... Uh, hit a lever or, or whatever it is all the way down like in lines through the honeycomb split split the hexagons in half and then that just allows the honey to flow all the way down to the bottom while it's uh being harvested and then you can close it back up again and the bees go back to work and you never have to disturb them it is amazing yeah i think it's one of those one of those really good ideas i know that people come up with a lot of things that seem like they would be good ideas and they seem really cool, but they're not actually very practical. But I think this is super practical and honestly, probably where the future of hives is going. I know it's, it's so strange that it's kind of such a simple idea, really. Yeah. But it took someone to really think about it and then develop it. Yeah. Cause the whole bee industry has been pretty much the same for, I think centuries. Really. Well, it would have been, yeah. And it's so much better for the bees in that you never have to disturb them. You never have to destroy their whole hive and honeycomb structure either because usually you would get them all out of there with smoke and you would take the honeycomb out then you would decap it and then you would take the honey out and then the bees have to start all the way back again building up that structure. Yes, yes, exactly. So it's probably even more efficient even if you just take out the disturbing factor um, in that they don't have to build the structures all again because the structures are just back there again and they're going back and putting the honey in. Yeah, well, that's precisely it. I suppose the only thing you don't get out of that is because I know a lot of people use the, the wax. That's true, yeah. yeah. And I think honeycomb is a thing that you eat as well sometimes. Mm. I'm not really sure exactly what the deal with that is. But, I mean, obviously, still, the, the traditional methods exist for that, but probably the main product you get from bees is honey anyway, so... I would say so. Like, honey's got to be worth a lot more than wax, right? Most probably, yeah. Mm. Just incredible, and probably something we're going to see all over the place now. You know, when I was watching it, it almost made me feel like I could have bees in my backyard. <laughs> I was about to ask you that. I don't know <laughs> if you heard that 
episode or two of Hello Internet where Gray was talking about what he might like to do when he retires. He was talking about, you know, I can really see myself being a beekeeper. <laughs> Not that he knows anything about it now, but just something about it. Well, uh, you you had some bees uh, clinging to the side of your house in Castlemaine. They're some, still there. Point, most, really? of the, most of the honeycomb sort of fell away, but there is still a presence there. Ah. They've been there for years and years and years. Well, they're probably inside your roof then, I'd imagine. Quite possibly. But they don't come inside, so that's fine. Because we, we had bees actually inside our walls at one point. Um, and they, for some reason, just decided to make a um, make their nest in, in the walls of our house. And you used to sit against the wall and you could hear them buzzing inside the wall. Oh, dear. That's not what you want. Is it bees or electricity? Yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> I um, I actually recently read a book um, by a Japanese author. It was just a it was a collection of short stories. And one of the short stories, um, this girl, uh, a, a, I think a, a friend or no, sorry, a relative of hers comes to stay with her in a, in a city in Japan, and. Um, this relative goes into student accommodation, um, but the student accommodation is a bit weird in the fact that it's quite difficult to get student accommodation in this particular city, but this whole building is basically deserted, like there aren't any students actually living in it, and um, kind of a variety of sort of creepy things happen um, in the story, but towards the end, she notices a huge stain on the wall, and there are bees everywhere outside the house um we're all kind of outside the building uh around this huge stain and the the i'm kind of spoiling the story here but basically the story the story ends um with her investigating or kind of crawling into the into the uh into the wall to find out if this is actually a beehive or if it's the body of her cousin who she hasn't seen in x amount of weeks and um it just kind of makes me think of that. I mean, we obviously never had any bodies in our uh, in our walls. I hope, but we did have a beehive. Know. As far as we as far as we know, it's actually quite sad because I think we had to uh, we had to. I don't think we smoked the bees out. I think we just sealed the uh, beehive, and the bees inside the walls died. Oh dear. Yeah. Bees can be a bit of a nuisance. Well. Yeah, but you know they they pollinate our flowers. I mean, they, oh they no, do they're fantastic! Good. But there's so many like cases of just like swarms of bees, kind of terrorizing people in in cities and that, and people have to come in and try to get them away from the area. Yes, yeah, well that's true. And you know, um, there's such thing as bee rustling. Bee rustling. <laughs> Apparently, it's quite a thing where people just steal bees from farms. Ah, uh, well, okay. So I suppose they they steal the queen, and then the rest of the bees follow. I'm not really sure how it works, but apparently there was one in the states that was like a million dollar bee heist. Wow! Only a few weeks ago. <laughs> wow. I think they got caught and the bees retrieved, but um, yeah. <laughs> That's such a peculiar thing to steal. Did you see the uh, shaky footage of um, the supposed? Something <laughs> of the thylacine or Tasmanian tiger. I, I did see that, so yes. Yeah. Um, and I think it's ridiculous, as are all shaky, ridiculous footage of any uh, supposedly extinct animal. The Tasmanian tiger has been trotted out a lot for these sorts of things. Like if you look back over, say, the last 20, 30 years, there's a um, town in WA that I can't remember the name of that is especially notorious for this. <laughs> claiming that they've seen it i mean it would be great if there were still some around but the few experts that looked at it said they really can't tell but if they had to guess they'd say it was a spotted quoll and not a tassie tiger it uh yeah it looked like its tail was a bit bushier than a tasmanian tiger because they're quite um got quite long thin tails yes and seriously how could you tell any from from that footage anyway yeah, what a ridiculous claim. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a few pixels because it's so far away. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. But it, you know, makes all the news, all the newspapers and that run with it. 
they love a good story like that, even if it's so far from true. Yeah, exactly. I wonder what you would get out of making a claim like that, though. Because, I mean, obviously, these people aren't experts on Tasmanian tigers, and um, they can't be sure that it's a Tasmanian tiger. Although they claim that they're sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there's always there's always some, I think. Always some slim hope that maybe, maybe. Yeah, well, that's I it. I guess that's maybe, why maybe. people like it. It's a shame that they all got killed off. Oh, look, it's a, it's a massive pity. Are an interesting animal. Well, they are exactly. Yeah, I actually did a uh, school project on Tasmanian tiger. I think. Oh, you, did you? Yeah. Is that one of those sort of postery ones, or? <laughs> I think it was. I, th- I think I still have the book. I remember doing one like that on a cheetah. Well, there you go. Perhaps you did cheetahs and I did Tasmanian tigers. Maybe, maybe. You might have had to do animals. And I think I had all these cuttings out of National Geographic. <laughs> Stuff oh really yeah yeah i i hand wrote all of mine and did a picture of a tasmanian tiger oh nice yeah i was i was legit with my projects back then yeah you were it's quite actually, the artist it's actually strange how uh my work started so well and then just deteriorated so <laughs> dramatically <laughs> maybe you just cared a little less as time went on i think i cared a lot less as time went on to be honest <laughs> Uh, it's hard to uh, keep that intensity, especially when the girls were doing such great work. Yeah, well, I actually think I actually think up to year eight, I did I did pretty decent work. It's just when I left the Steiner School, mm. went into the dirty public system. Did you do a harp for the final year project? I did do a harp for the final year project. Yeah, yeah that was pretty cool. Yeah, I think I think that was quite nice. What did you do for yours? I uh, did a clock. Oh, like I got an old clock, old clock yeah. and then I that wasn't working. Repaired the mechanism with the help of an old fella in Castlemaine that knows all about this stuff, mm-hmm. and then I put it in like a modern housing kind of. It was sort of like a triangle but curved. I don't know if you remember. No, I think I do. Do you still own it? Yeah, it's still at my parents' place. Yeah, so is my harp. I think. Hmm. You did learn to play it a little bit, didn't you? So you could give a demonstration or something. I, I did. I, I played a. Uh, I played a song. I knew how to play one song in the harp, and that was what I played. This story about Elon Musk and war and AI, Alex. Maybe you could run me through it quickly and refresh my memory. Uh, well, b- basically, what it was what it was talking about is um, really it was an article written around a tweet by Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, they saw Elon Musk's tweet and decided to write about it, um, which seems to be journalism nowadays. But um, <laughs> yes, Elon Musk has essentially tweeted that um, the the race to develop AI will be the uh, the cause of World War Three. But is essentially what it came down to. So uh, it'll be the next nuclear arms race, um, and he is predicting that uh, yeah, it'll it'll trigger a, a worldwide war, which hopefully it won't. Um, but certainly. I think AI has a, uh, a huge, a bit, or has the ability to have a huge consequence. Um, what they mentioned in the article as well is that um, they they say that whoever controls AI in the future will be the next world leader, um, and they also mention um, uh, some some a speech that Vladimir Putin gave to uh, some students in Russia, which actually seems a bit strange and out of context. Uh, oh, sorry, out of character with uh, Putin, because what he was saying is if we develop this technology, we'll share it with the world. Which doesn't seem a very Russian thing to do, at least in my in my knowledge of Russia. Well, yeah, but maybe that's what they claim in public, but if they ever come up with some really good stuff, they wouldn't actually share that. Well, yeah, I mean, it seems unlikely, doesn't it? But, uh, yeah, so so basically that is, uh, that's what he was saying. Um, and uh, also, Putin has also acknowledged the fact that uh, AI could have a huge a huge a huge consequence in the world um apparently it is being discussed in in the un um because obviously ai has huge or can have a huge impact in 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 war essentially mm. if it starts making decisions on what targets it hits who it well kills, exactly all that sort when, of thing. when you've got fully autonomous robots that can go to war and uh and then when you've got systems that can decide what to attack and how to and how to uh, proceed with an attack, then uh, 
yeah, you've well essentially got a massive problem, I guess. Yeah, taking the human out of the decision making process leaves a lot less room for empathy and yes, situational exactly. awareness. Well, exactly, yeah, and as well as this, um, there isn't apparently there isn't really any um, any rules that the UN, which is basically I suppose as close as the world gets to a governing body, uh, has around um, autonomous war systems. So any country could potentially have, I guess, a, a fully AI system that it could go to war with. And um, as yet, there aren't any particular rules that the UN has devised around it. Mm, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Or to stop the development of this technology as well. Because, I mean, obviously what the UN tries to do, without any huge <laughs> conviction, is, uh, you know, con- control what people are developing. So... A good example of this is, I suppose, North Korea and the development of nuclear weapons, which is happening at the moment. Um, and they try to discourage the development of further nuclear weapons by trade sanctions and blah, 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 which don't really seem to be working, obviously. And, uh, yeah, just trying to stop this technology actually being developed in the first place. But they haven't really done anything with this around AI yet. Yeah, which, I mean... They're already behind the eight ball, right? There's so many co- countries and companies that are developing this sort of stuff. Yeah, exactly. None of it's probably ready for prime time, but there's certainly a lot of work being done on it. Yes, exactly, yeah. And, and I think that, you know, if the UN could agree on the fact that it, AI should never actually make it into war at all, I mean, war obviously shouldn't happen, but... You know, yeah, but I love it, it how there's it rules war. of war and there's yes. war crimes when yes. the whole thing is just yeah but anyway anyway you, you're right if, if given the governing body quote-unquote that we have in place and sort of the rules that seem to be agreed upon it would be nice if that sort of fell within that set oh absolutely yeah i mean uh, yeah it would be perfect if it didn't get used at all but uh mm. yeah at least some some limitations on it would be per- would be preferable yes and maybe some transparency on anyone sort of researching that kind of area. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, although really we don't, I suppose, know how far the military's got with it. No, of course not. But it's it kind of almost seems like one of those things, not maybe quite the same, but, you know, people researching deadly viruses and that. There's so many checks and balances in place to make sure that it can't get out into the wider population. And I don't really think there's probably a huge risk of like a really sophisticated piece of artificial intelligence, like getting onto the internet and controlling everything. But it's possible that something could get out and do some amount of damage that could be bad. So I feel like maybe there should be more restrictions about that sort of thing as well. I think people that are smart that are researching this do have those systems in place, but there's a lot of other people I'm sure that are working on it that have a more cavalier attitude towards it oh definitely without a doubt mm. you're right i suppose if, if it's if it's sensibly contained but um i mean what happens when we get to the point where ai is sophisticated enough that if it does get onto the internet it will do damage and presumably once it gets to that level of sophistication it could exist in quite a few areas of our life so yes yeah it's both scary and exciting the opportunities of ai yes exactly Hmm. Hopefully it won't pop up in my lifetime. That's what I think. I feel like we're pretty safe. By the time we get some really sophisticated stuff, we'll probably just see the early benefits of it before we get too many of the downsides. I reckon. Yes. Yep. Which is quite good. Not so great yeah. for the future generations. But, uh, <laughs> no. That's their problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Jolly good point, David. Jolly good point. Yeah. Thanks again for joining me, Alex. Not a problem, David. Pleasure as always. You can follow and get in touch with us on Twitter at Tangential Soup, and you can find this week's show notes with more information about today's topics at tsp.fm slash 23. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider sharing it with anyone that you think might also, and we'll talk to you again next week. Bye. See ya.
different this week, Alex. I did. It's, it's usually the chow. Occasion. Yeah, it is usually the chow. Um, well, I actually, I could do a cooking. I could do a cooking corner. Have you got some interesting stuff for a cooking corner? I have I have my roast today. That's my interesting stuff for the cooking corner. What roast is it? It's beef. Um, so, as I think I've mentioned previously, I am starting to source my meat from butchers as opposed to going to the supermarket, okay. which I was kind of in the habit of doing. Um, well, basically, since I've been in Sydney, I used to buy my meat from the supermarket because... Convenient. Well, you know, it's convenient and... They're open longer. I've, they're open longer. You know, you get everything in one hit. You don't yep. have to worry about... Um, you know, you don't have to worry about going to the butcher and kind of looking at the stuff and wondering what you actually want. Everything's kind of already pre-weighed for you. Um, and for someone who, certainly for a lot of my early 20s, didn't really understand how much 500 grams of anything was, it's just <laughs> nice to have it pre-measured for you so you can just sit there and look at it. Yes. Um, which, by the way, isn't a reason to be scared of going to the butcher because <laughs> they'll help you. Ridiculous reason not to. Um, so... I went to the butcher and I got a two kilogram um, kind of cut of beef. I think it's a, I think it's a rump cut of beef. It's a pretty decent size one. Yeah. Oof. Looks so good as well. You'll be eating that for days. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> and uh, to go with that, there is uh, sweet potato, um, carrot, a couple of potatoes which I just had left over, so I just chucked them in and uh green beans and i've actually done a sauce of it's not actually sauce it's kind of more of a more of a rub you know what i'm talking about yeah i think um, so but it's not really rub it's more of a paste i'm gonna call <laughs> it a paste it's a paste of um a bit of beef stock and mustard and black pepper okay where i came up with this david i don't know but i just <laughs> just came up with it and oh, your own invention my, my own invention exactly i would have i think i so i used dijon mustard for the uh for the rub i think i would have preferred to have a cd mustard but I, you know i just used what i had and um actually at the butcher as well i saw something that i think i'm going to go back and get it's duck fat mm. have you ever have you ever cooked anything duck fat i haven't no but it, you've tasted duck fat when you've tasted duck obviously yeah it's like a really sweet fat yeah it and is. I, I think i'm going to try cooking steak in duck fat <laughs> that sounds awfully decadent but also delicious <sighs> I'm actually salivating thinking about it. It sounds amazing. <laughs> so that's that's my uh, that's my plan. I'll let you know how I go with my steak and duck fat. Yes, please do. And um, aside from that, uh, have I talked about my lentil soups? Um, I don't think so. Not any time recently, at least. Lentil soup has become a bit of a passion for me. Okay. Um, and it's so easy as well. All you do is you get about four times as much stock as you're using lentils for so for every 250 mils of lentil you use you get uh two liters of stock yep that's correct is it <laughs> no, that's not me. correct at all <laughs> no know. it's not correct at all for every 250 mils of lentils you use you use one liter of stock because one to four ratio okay and um you can literally just get a liter of stock 250 mils of lentils and like a carrot a potato an onion garlic and um just some parsley and basil chuck it all in a pot together simmer it for like 45 minutes and you have like a delicious lentil stew or mm. s- well it's actually a soup but i mean lentils always end up coming out a bit stewish so call it a stew what sort of stock do you use or is best uh vegetable stock okay Vegetable stock is nice, um, but you, you could use any stock, really, depending on what you're doing. Um, you can also chuck meat in that as well. Maybe just put a little bit of extra liquid in there for the meat. Yeah. And Bob's your uncle, and it's just spectacular, David. It does sound good. I might try that yeah. one. Yeah. Do. Because, I mean, th- there is no preparation that goes into it, too. <laughs> I mean, you've got to peel and chop the potato and peel and chop the carrot, and do the same with the onion and the garlic and but that's it. I reckon preparation time will probably be about 10 minutes. Yeah. And then obviously the cooking time on top of that. But um, with if the only thing is you, you've you got to make sure you're stirring it every 10 minutes or so because lentils tend to stick to the bottom of the pot. Okay, yeah. Yeah. But other than that, bam. Really, I'm really loving cooking at the moment. 
It's a, it's a strange. I think I think maybe I should I should start doing some YouTube videos of cooking. Yeah, you should. I was just about to ask that. Where's the first one? Um, it's coming. We've got to think of a name. What name do you think we could use? Well, I could use. Well, I need your help to think of a name. Cars cooking. Um, I want something a bit out there. You know, Jamie okay. Oliver had the Naked Chef. I mean, I don't want to be the Naked <laughs> Chef, but okay, yeah. I'll have to think on it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm sure there's some good ones. But I mean, for me, I don't like spending hours cooking something. I like my preparation time to be fairly minimal. You know, I don't like sitting there and then like adding little bits in at a time or you know really intensive cooking processes i like it to be easy delicious but you know also to be fairly healthy as well yeah quick and healthy yeah exactly so um if you can help me out with that i will i will i will make my first cooking show okay my first cooking episode will do <laughs> and then we can tack it on to tangential soup as an extra <laughs> <laughs>